Welcome, everyone. We get one of our, I don't know, semi-rare crochet events today. I think we have a lot more knitting events than crochet events. So I always enjoy the crochet events. And for some reason, um, Lorinda, I'll warn you in advance that we tend to get some we tend to get some crazy people in the crochet rooms. I don't know why. I, they're just uh, crochet people. Just seem to be a very fun group, and so we tend to get some. We tend to get some interesting, um, interesting people in our crochet events. I'm not really sure why that is, but um, I I don't know. Maybe it's just you know only We're having one thing crazy. in your hands instead of having two needles or something. But it's a little bit crazy. So, but I'm really excited to welcome a first time visitor, Lorinda Reddick. Which those of you who are, who are um, big time crocheters, because I'm kind of an amateur crocheter, but the big time crocheters you will recognize Lorinda because she's basically been in every magazine, and um, and I mean, pretty much I don't know you Polish just are the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but, for but, a couple of years now. but Lorinda has um, come up with this crazy new technique that actually doesn't give you an ugly wrong side of your crochet. And I, and that's kind of a big, I love color work. I am just a huge fan of color. I can't imagine knitting anything in just one color, but the downside is always what the back looks like. So I tend to only do color work if it's in the round. So you can't, see the ugly backside. So I never use it for things like scarves or, or blankets or anything where you, you know, you're going to, you're going to see the other side of it. And, and especially with scarves, you know, where you can try to mush them around all you want, but the bottom line is the back is going to show. So this is, this is really, I, this is really crazy and crazy in a good way, crazy in a good way. So I'm glad you're here to talk to us about it, Lorinda. So, so tell us about really how you got started with crochet and designing in crochet. Let's see. <laughs> it's a long story. Um, I um, started in junior high school. I had about a mile walk home and halfway up the second hill on the way home was my campfire leader's house and she was a stay-at-home mom and and would usually be doing a craft and one day she was making granny squares and she um, taught me how and I still have a, a tree a Christmas tree skirt I eventually made with those granny squares oh my gosh almost nobody <laughs> I've met ever has the first thing they made that's crazy that's that's uh, it's an heirloom now yeah, <laughs> yeah. Those first couple, of the that and my first blanket. I nobody ever taught me to weave in ends, so I have a whole section on that in the book because I know, and I always try to include specifics of how to weave them in when in my patterns because nobody ever told me leave long ends, weave them in. I had little tiny ends. Oh, little tiny. I have this blanket where you change color almost every row, and they're little tiny. That was the one perk of using the uh, the acrylic yarn. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's twenty years later. It's still those ends haven't come unwoven. I will have to say but, that might be the only perk of using, <laughs> exactly. like, yeah. especially where, if we're, if we're, if, yeah, if we're talking like, yeah, obviously we can see part of your, we'll just say part of your stash behind you. But you know, that's the thing about those acrylic yarns from like 20 years ago. They were, they were indestructible and I'm sure they will be in landfills in 300 years. Those, whatever's in there is still going to be intact you can't kill it no matter what you do to it even if you try you'll probably light it on fire and it's still gonna survive so well, so I you but you graduated you graduated yeah. yarn but you also yeah. graduated what you were working on yeah over time I um you know I'd stop and pick it up as as each time through high school and college I'd meet different people who taught me different things along the way and um, actually in high school at a church camp a friend was doing these tapestry crochet um, beanies and I found out recently that she actually learned to do that technique because she was making them for the Rastafarian shop that she <laughs> worked at <laughs> so they could sell these beanies. Oh how funny. <laughs> <laughs> and she, so she had taught me this technique, and so that was all I really ever learned. I only learned from picking things up from people. We didn't have the internet back then. And so that's what I had learned about color work was carrying the yarn. And I'd made some kind of crazy things over the years with, made this great sweater that was my, my not quite boyfriend sweater because my, we weren't, he wasn't my boyfriend yet, but now he's my husband. Well, see, there. years last month. You, so. So you broke the sweater curse, huh? Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, and it was color work, so I still have that around somewhere. I'm like, I need to take that to classes as an example of it was carrying the yarn, and I did double check in the in it was a whole book of what they called jacquard back then of color work sweaters, and there's very little instruction of how to handle those yarns. And at one point they do say carry the yarn, so I guess it was, but carrying the yarn under double crochet, you see those colors peeking through, and so then about a uh, Three, three, four years ago, well, I, eight years ago when my son was born, my dad, who had been in the knitter in the family but wasn't knitting in those, um, in my early years when I was learning, so I hadn't learned, learned from him, and he picked it up again when he was expecting his first grandchild, my son, who just turned nine last week, and um, he, his first project was this crazy intarsia um, Afghan knitted with little tiny animals all around it and it was wow. done in the round but it was in Tarsha and so I'd seen him doing this dropping and picking up and he went on to design a whole line of scarves um, that were all he's also a musician he was putting out his CD and he designed oh a scarf gosh. an Intarsha scarf yeah I have, <laughs> you, have <laughs> you have artsy family <laughs> yes and so he did these scarves and each one is an Intarsha image from the that he was making them for the composer of each piece of music on his CD. And so he took either the cover of the music piece or an image that was related to it and put that in Intarsha. And he was so frustrated that he couldn't do it reversibly. And so, two, so let's see, July 1st in 2011, I decided, got it into my head, I was going to make a mystery machine afghan for my son. I, we were doing a Scooby-Doo birthday party and oh God. I was, I was like, <laughs> oh, I want to paint my van to look like the Scooby-Doo van. And one of my friends jokingly said, why don't you yarn bomb it? <laughs> so, so I started picking up yarn <laughs> and in the right colors and stuff. And then I realized that would be a lot of crazy that's a, that's crochet, a lot. but I could just yeah. do an afghan that looks like it and so I just thought oh well I'll just take the picture and put it on graph paper and go and because I generally work in double crochet or half double taller stitches I just kept going and <laughs> um, oh my god oh I see somebody people were talking about red heart and I did yeah. want to defend you know yes they, it acrylic will yarn is forever. Still great for Afghans. Yes. Yeah, and I will say acrylic <laughs> acrylic is, yarn has come a long yeah. way in twenty years as well. And you know, yeah, it's like that's a broker. What you were talking about, yeah, like twenty years 20, ago. Year, yeah. twenty years ago. Oh my god, it was horrible. It was so scratchy you couldn't even stand to have it in your hands. And they said Red Heart yeah. will live forever. And yeah, and which I which I agree. In the um and the Barocco line of like their comfort yarns are so yeah. crazy soft. Oh, it's and on the cover of the book too. Yeah. Oh, is that a Barocco yarn? That's what I ended up using for each. Yeah, that's the comfort. And I ended up using that for each of the individual squares in the book. Yeah. And I also have one in, in Red Heart's new With Love, which is kind of in between their soft and their the regular stuff. That's It's a really nice, you know. And because that was my big challenge was looking for washable yarns. I'm like, I'm making mm -hmm. afghans. I, yeah. I, I tried to use, I, I did cloth diapering with my kids and, and occasionally I had a few wool covers, but I never crocheted, I never made a lot of wool covers because I knew that eventually they'd get washed and shrunk and, and they weren't. And they'd fit the covers, dolls. So. Yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah, so I, that was my big challenge with the book of Afghans was finding enough yarn to, uh, or finding washable yarns. So I, I have to say you were the very first person who's ever told me that the knitter in their family was their dad which I think is totally cool. So it's always, the, you know, their mom taught them or their grandmother taught them or the lady at the local yarn store taught them. But I, I have to say, I don't know. I'll ask people in the room. Do you, have you, I mean, if you can type in and let me know if, if you've ever heard somebody say, my dad was the knitter in the family. I mean, that was that, and that's so cool. I, yeah, that j did not happen in, in my <laughs> house either. So yeah, I don't think anybody, yeah. And it's Kate says she doesn't know any men knitters. I only well, know the, the story goes that my mom actually taught him. She had just learned and taught him the basics and then he'll get into something and just go off with it. Obviously. With oh, the <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. If he's doing color work like that, if he's doing picture yeah. knitting, he, he definitely, Moved past the garter stitch scarf. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah. We, Trisha says the only ones she knows are from podcasts. I mean, it's usually yeah. the, the male knitters become famous because yeah. they're a very small pool well, of them, right? Yeah. There's a very, very small pool of them. Yeah. So, Renee's dad upholstered but didn't knit or crochet. <laughs> so, we'll give him credit for some creativity, though, right? So, but I think upholstery is, is 
just seems like more of a guy thing too. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, it began as a men's thing. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and I know especially crochet, I think, attracted attracts more men maybe than, especially young ones, than knitting necessarily does since it becomes, I think I've got somebody not muted. Sorry, Heidi, I'm getting ready to mute you. So um, they're, uh, you know, with all the ski things and it's kind of skater things and the crochet oh, yeah. with the young guys became more popular. And, uh, oh gosh, that's so funny. Her, she has her, Connie says she has her grand, her grandmother who's a hundred taught her, gave her the, her first project, which was an Afghan, which I, they laugh at, which, I, you know, it must be acrylic because it's still around. So <laughs> it has well, not some gone. of that cotton lace work, the, you know, the thread work, that's, there's a lot of that. There was an am amazing, so I just got back from the knit and crochet show in Manchester, New Hampshire, and um, I always have to say New Hampshire, I was confusing some people. They kept saying, oh, your trip to England. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you only wish. <laughs> yes. Um, so, there was uh, after the fashion show, someone sh was showing off. They had an an antique um, lace Irish lace dress. This tiny, tiny like I can't even imagine the the size hook they used to make this, and it was still in good shape that she could put it on. And oh I was like, oh, she even was letting people touch it. I was like, it was you know yellowed, but it was still still in was still amazing. in one piece. Wow. Yeah. So so let's talk about the like how you came up with this technique. This is a true like like necessity being the mother of invention kind of thing. So, yep, back to the story about the mystery machine. That's yeah. what I developed it on was um, – so I started – I just jumped into making this mystery machine and the wheels I did tapestry crochet and I'd been carrying the yarn and I didn't really like the the pink or what is it the orange and and green peeking through each other and so when I got to the body of it I thought oh I'll try this intarsia thing my dad's been doing because I really didn't want the green background poking through the orange letters of the mystery machine and um, who would so I exactly <laughs> so I just started going and I, because I had always carried the yarn and then I'd kind of gotten in the habit of carrying at least part of my tails as I went and even up inside the stitches, I just did what made sense to me and it was about at least six or eight months before I realized that it was not what everyone else was doing. <laughs> so yeah, so I, so I made the mystery machine and um, just did it as I was going and just did it nonstop for about a month till I had everything except for the window with the people in it. And my friends kept saying, oh, are you going to do all the people? I'm like, oh, that would be crazy. But by the time I'd finished the rest of it, I did a couple of rows of just white for the window and was like, well, this is boring. And so I dove into my stash and and just picked all the right colors for the, the people and went for it. And then and it was just before the they were having submissions for the um, – Crochet Guild of America's design competition, and I'd been thinking about it for years. I guess I should say that um, I met my first crochet designer around 2001, 2002, Karen Ratohuli. I was actually in her crochet guild during a short time. I lived in Seattle for a couple of years, and she was just just having her some of her first things published and brought something to the guild and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun someday to maybe submit, maybe try to get one pattern in a magazine. I think I was waiting until I was appointed in my life that I would just be able to go for it because obviously once I started, I couldn't stop. <laughs> so Connie wants to know if you have a picture of that, if if you have a picture of that mag of that, um, the mystery machine, because you should put it up on your blog today so that people I can do. see it. There's actually a link that you can follow, and I'll have to double check that the links are still up. But uh, I did a whole three-part um, blog post, yes, blog post on the uh, Crochet Liberation Front, uh, and there's links to it. If you go on, we'll get to my blog. Yeah, I'll show you my blog later, it. and if you scroll down a little, there's a picture of the mist, little picture of the mystery machine, and if you click on that, it it's a post that has the links to all three of those with this whole story and more details there you about go. the process of making them. So and my. Little so cat window keeps shrinking, so I have to make it big. Yes. So, all right. So, so you realize you're doing something completely new that these other people are not doing, and that you have figured out a way to make the backside look as nice as the front side, which is will come in handy for lots of kind different kinds of projects. And so, then starts the pro the process for this book. 
So, yeah. so I want to kind of talk about how the book is built because it's kind of, it, it, it's nice that it starts off with kind of easy learn how to do it sort of quilt blocks. And then it moves into more and more kind of, it moves up a level and moves up a level. And then it gives you like 10 really gorgeous um, Afghan projects, which is a nice way to use all of your, um, all the learning blocks that you've just been working on. So it's yeah. great. So, so, so we start with kind of like basic linear kind of shapes, right? Yeah. Yeah. We start with the upright um, stitches just because it's easier. It's just the easiest way to start. There's one little change that you're making in the way you make your color changes that I call the yarn flip and kind of have to see it to, <laughs> but there's great illustrations throughout the book. I took pictures of everything step by step and then Charles Voth, who was my tech editor and illustrator, and he actually was sort of what inspired when I first started submitting patterns, I took a pattern writing class with him and we got chatting afterwards um, and when he realized my that I had this unusual technique, he said he was the one that suggested you need to come up with a pattern that is that teaches the whole technique. And um, I see that question. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it teaches the whole technique, and um, and you know, propose an article or something. And so this actually originally the first three. Um, blocks or so in each of the sections um, were the teaching ones that I had developed as mm -hmm. like a 12, 12 block, you know, I was thinking of like a crochet along every week, you know, do that. Yeah, or Kate, every month do a new block. So. And Kate wants to know if you have a million yes. ends to sew in with this technique. So there are, there are quite a lot of ends, but like I was saying about how I would tend to carry my yarn ends, I have a whole section on weaving in ends, and I have a number of little tricks. Like when we get to the one that shows the spiral square, you can I have these little tricks with where you switch back or if you need the yarn over here you can do and so I've just developed all these little things to help save on ends there's still going to be a beginning and an ending end of each color section but at wherever possible I tried to carry the yarn but only under or over the exact the same color so that you're not you don't get that show those. through yeah yeah and so and I in, in that's one of the things in the learning blocks I actually tell you where to carry them because I want you to get used to that okay you can carry the yarn here and this will help you get to there you know and my my other main thing that I do is just I carry whenever I start a new color or I carry the yarn for the couple inches and then I leave just a little end so then you're really only having to weave back in one direction in the other direction to lock it up and not have as much weaving in ends, but I have to admit that I did actually hire <laughs> my best friend to do a lot of the end weaving in this because I had 10 afghans to make oh, in four yeah. months no, and I realized no, no. I might be able to make the afghans <laughs> and because it's such a new technique I didn't have any contractors uh, trained up yet to do it so Oh yeah, there's a, that's a challenge because you can't just hire a contract crocheter to do it for you because it's Exactly Yeah so I'm getting there. <laughs> yes. So it's uh, it's fun. Yes. As the contractors need your book so that they yep, can learn exactly. this technique. Well, and because, you know, anytime you're doing anything that's color work, you know, those ideas about how to carry the color and how to avoid all those ends is going to work no matter what you're working on. So, yeah, I agree. So this, this is, this is, uh, this is, this is like really cool. So now and this is a step up. This is working in diagonals, right? Yep. So yes. And I think these are all the diagonals just in half double crochet. So all the picture squares are also just in half double just because they're easier to explain. <laughs> I did my first couple of pieces in um in double crochet because with the double crochet basically we get into half color stitches where the top half is one color and the bottom half is the other. And the main difference with my technique is that I do those half color stitches for double crochets and increases and decreases. So like the zigzag one is all increases and decreases and you're just practicing every time you have a decrease you have an increase to so you maintain the same number of stitches but it creates much smoother lines yeah. than you get with um, and then the one that's just the diagonal stripes like up in the left corner. Yeah, that one is Up in the left corner? In, <laughs> no, because yeah, you just put your, corner. Like your hand <laughs> in front of the camera. It was like in that corner This is my first time on a web. No, no, that's okay. I do the same thing so <laughs> So that's the 
one of the reasons in, ha in half double is a little bit easier because you don't have those half color stitches, but instead I do what I call late color changes. So it, where any instructions that you look for, they, if you read any book that has instruct or pattern that has instructions on color changes, it always tells you work up to the last yarn over of the last stitch in the previous color, mm -hmm. then drop that yarn over with the new color and pull it up through the stitch. But if you're working in a diagonal, it actually gets those nice smooth diagonals by creating late color changes. So you actually complete your last stitch in, the, in one direction, in the direction you're angling. You complete the last stitch in the stitch in, in the first color. Then you pick up the new color. And so after you complete that first stitch in the new color, the, the top loop is the old color. So when you're working on that diagonal, you have the right color in there, and you don't have those little bits of the wrong color that stick through in most color work that you see. Do you, do you, does that yeah, make yeah sense? no, it does. It does. It does. It does absolutely not. And generally, in crochet, I've done I've done stripes, which I use the traditional technique of just pulling up that last loop in the new color. So yeah, but that it totally makes sense when you're you're changing direction. Yes. So not, yeah. <laughs> so very cool. So and then we move on from there. We go on to crazy uh, shapes. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this spiral. I think that's just so cool that and that, that I would be able to flip that over and it doesn't look like hell. So <laughs> yeah, that's like it, it's beautiful. So tell us tell us about this these blocks here. This um, this level up now. Well, so in my original twelve squares, I wasn't actually doing the quilt specifically inspired squares but I had this spiral one that where the the colors started from the corners and they came up together and it wasn't quite as spiraled but a quilter friend of mine looked at it and was like oh this looks a lot like this um, snail trail or, or drunkard's path square that is really common in quilting and so I started looking at patterns and I, I did a blog post where I showed the original square and where I, I, I just ran, a, did a running stitch of an alternate color to show myself where I should make changes to create this really tight spiral that ended up. So there's actually an afghan with that's um, 30 of those spirals, <laughs> but you match the corners and there's all different ways you can use this pattern to create. Um, to create different patterns within the patterns. So yeah, and I love... My, I love the one on the lower left, which actually looks like a traditional star quilt square yeah, so in crochet. Once I, yeah, once I started with this the, with the snail trail, I thought, oh, what other quilt patterns? Because I can get those diagonals. So I actually pulled out my the quilt that I took a beginning quilt class about 20 years ago, <laughs> and I still have to finish hand quilting the edges because I get too busy with yarn. But I pulled it out, and that one specifically, those two, the, both that and the wild card one up in the left, are from that quilt, that original quilt that I did. I took those ideas and just figured, oh, well, if I yeah. do it this way and... It's so, so amazing because it normally when I see a quilt-like crocheted afghan, it's done with solid sections that have been pieced yeah, together. Where you're adding on to each other. Or yeah, them. exactly. So yeah. this is this is beautiful because you can get such detail, which is really really gorgeous. And then um, Barbara wants to know: Have are you making videos for your technique? I know you're teaching classes. I'm, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just. Um, I'm. We're working on it. <laughs> I'm left-handed, so this is the main. Oh, uh, yeah. Being left-handed actually comes into to play with the the pictures in the book. That someone that saw my book recently was like, "So where's the cutout that shows the reverse side?" And there's only a few of the Afghans where they've flipped over a corner or they've they've taken the picture just right so you can see both sides. And a lot of times you can't. But the thing to keep in mind is because I'm left-handed, the side you're seeing is actually the back. <laughs> When I was working, um, yeah. I get to the end, and if I can, if you can, if the right-handers consider the first row their right side, I consider that my wrong side. So my right side is your wrong side. So this is actually the back of everything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> funny, funny. <laughs> but back to videos where I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah, <laughs> so you need I to need like find a right-handed friend left who can do it. Because you know, so, I, because I have, I have, uh, I have like over a hundred how-to videos on. Planet Pearl's YouTube channel and every once in a while I'll get a, a note from somebody that says, can you show us how to do this left-handed? It's like, no, my left hand doesn't work at all. It just doesn't. I'm so severely right-handed. So it's, it is, and I do, it is hard, I think for people to, because re to reverse it, you know, figure it out in reverse. So I think left-handed people are best if they're going to talk to net either to 
be taught with both hands ambidextrously to knit right-handed or to learn from somebody who's, yeah, Moosker's here says she's left-handed, to learn from somebody well, who can teach them left-handed. My, my first crochet book I actually independently published so that I could do a completely left-handed edition. So it's the first book ever written, and it's a learn to crochet sampler. So, yeah, I, I like this sampler concept for teaching things. Mm -hmm. And it was, so I took all the photos left-handed. It's the first book ever written entirely for lefties and then flipped over for the righties. Oh, how so. funny. Yeah, usually, usually right-handed people get that get the first crack at it so and and this is so cute because this is really uh like what we traditionally think of as in in tarja but done in a way that doesn't make you afraid to turn the blanket over which is which is a, which is a nice thing so and there's a lot yeah it's, connie says fun um kid squares and candy saying she likes this technique and can't wait to get the book which who knows candy you might win it today so but candy teaches and so she wants to teach this technique at her local college for crocheters. Where, where, oh, where, where do you teach? Where do you teach candy? <laughs> she, it takes a second to catch. Oh, up. Decatur. So yeah, oh. and um, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, Moosker says most lefties have been taught a mishmash of both, which I think is prob is probably yeah. true because I think it's harder to find someone to teach you someone who's left-handed who's mastered it and to find someone to teach you that way. I, I just learned, I didn't even realize for the longest time that I was do, following, following all the instructions backwards. <laughs> I, um, I actually learned just facing someone, and I think it helped that I'd been doing dance classes since I was three. So I was like, okay, you just follow the opposite, because in dance classes you always mirror things. So it just made sense with, the, with crocheting for me. And I've, I've met a lot of people who have learned like that. And now that I, and since I've been teaching for a long time, I can, I've gotten, I've gotten comfortable enough with my right hand and it actually slows down my crochet. So I think it helps. But. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. If I had to oh, do it left-handed, yes. I'd be in trouble. I, I have actually reversible cables is a great question because that's the other thing that I do. <laughs> and um, I just had an article in Crochet Magazine on this Intarsia technique and their next issue, their winter winter issue will have an issue, have a article that I did on my reversible cables. So Oh, so that's something to yeah. <laughs> make sure you like make. I saw Trisha asked. About yeah, that. Trisha asked about that reversible cables, which another thing that's tough because they always they look crappy on the backside so. i think because i'm left-handed everything i think of everything should be reversible <laughs> yeah barbara says this would be a great craftsy class something yeah. to think about yep it's, I, when you have time because i know it's just it even just from doing yes. my own videos i know it's just very 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 time consuming to do them so yeah, yeah if it hadn't been for this it was being something so new, I might not have rushed, you know, done things so fast because I have a four-year-old still. So I'm I'm kind of holding off for her to get into kindergarten at least before I start doing a little more traveling and that sort of thing. So yeah, eh, that's what happens when you got little ones. Exactly. I was telling Beth that see, this is the pretty corner of my craft room. The rest of it is covered in glitter because <laughs> my four-year-old and her best friend discovered the glitter. <laughs> You'll be finding it for months. So, yeah, it's like after you take your Christmas trees down, you know, there's, you find glitter in the corners of rooms just forever. So good luck with that. <laughs> so good. All of us, who've been, all of us who've been through that, wish you good luck with that. So, um, so there's actually 10 Afghans in the book. And so I just kind of, I pulled a selection and to kind of, so people could see how the different sort of shapes and techniques can come together and create. I mean, really gorgeous projects. And what really struck me was the, um, was actually the one that's top center where it's a crocheted lace Afghan with the border done in this technique. So it's, um, so, so kind of, kind of walk us through, you know, what we're looking at. And for people who are, um, maybe newer crocheters as well as new, new to the technique, um, do you like recommend one of the Afghans in the book more than the other as like a beginner's project? Well, the one on the cover because it's um, because it walks you through step by step. But even doing just those first few squares to get the angles in half double, I think the half double it's just easier because it has the late color changes and it has the um, and like I said the picture one, so the garden one, which I named after my dad, and 
<laughs> the space one um, are all those all those pictures are just done in half double crochets with increases and decreases. So really, it, once you know basic stitches, if you're comfortable with it's the getting comfortable with changing colors, which is why I started with just if you follow those sampler squares for the learn to learn to crochet or learn intarsia sampler, um, you start with two colors and then three colors, and you can ease yourself into it. And so I just thought that's an easier way to go. Um, but yeah, so any of those. Um, what I tried to do, once I got the quilt idea, I knew some of them needed to be connected right onto each other, so there is a lot of seaming. But as much as, as often as I could, I would do um, joins that didn't involve a lot of seaming. Yeah, we all appreciate that. And you know, what's really great is like how m modern these quilt pieces look. You know, I mean, in addition to the fact that, you know, the color palettes are really like beautiful and fresh and very modern, they don't look like the ones my grandmother made my mother they're really really um they just really look modern is that they're um you know it's, i don't know there's just there's there's something that says i would put this on a modern sofa and it would look just great so and actually uh, trisha had a question she said uh, can the afghans be done in <laughs> single crochet or double crochet so one of the things i don't all of these um this technique doesn't work as well in single crochet. You can do add a, a little bit of increases and decreases, but really it's because of the taller stitches you can create full. When you're working into single crochets and you work into the top of it, then you lose half the stitch. There's only one loop left. And it even though you can follow a grid, it doesn't quite work. And that's why you get all those little bits of wrong color on either side. Um, so, now, like you, I said, I really, yes. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, no, and Connie says it's incentive to do more color work, which I agree. You know, I, I, because oh. life is, life is too short to crochet in one color. And Kate, I saw on the space one, can you click back sure. for a second? I wanted to show them. So if you, I always tell people when I show the book, so see the space one and hanging on the wall behind, those pictures are my son's original drawings that I took them. He drew them on graph paper and I took them and I turned them into the robot and the af and the alien. How and cute so, is that? And what, yeah. a, what a great idea though, to take like a child's drawing and actually create um, something that lasts for ever, you know, as a, as a, um, as a gift, which is just really special. So yep. the, uh, so, um, Barbara wants to know if you have a favorite brand of crochet hooks. Um, you're taking a survey. So usually it's, <laughs> is it boy or Susan Bates? It's, I like the, I, I like the shape of the boy heads usually, but what I've been finding lately is I like what I call fat bottomed hooks. So some of That's the ones, the ones I use. Fimo, yeah, I have a friend who does, a local friend who does the Fimo hooks, and I have another friend who hand carves wooden hooks, So and she's very precise on the sizing of each side of the hook, so I, I pretty much use theirs now. Um, and it was mainly because when I was working on these 10 afghans in four months, <laughs> I started getting the ones, I was like, I'm going to have a hook in my hand nonstop for, you know, months. Yeah. And so I needed the ones that <laughs> had a wider grip. <laughs> and I actually, at one point, I misplaced it. And I picked I picked up a regular one, and my thumb, like, locked on the thumb holder. <laughs> but that's the, the main other thing is it has to have a thumb grip that's flat, so it helps me, you know. Where yeah, I think they're just easier on your hands, you yeah. know, I think it's just yeah. easier on your hands and uh, people who knit with those little or who crochet with those little tiny steel hooks yeah. that are like toothpicks. I just don't know how they don't end up with, you know, claw hands because it's just it's so hard. It's just so hard on your hands. So I agree. So awesome book. So I know people are going to want to. Oh, yeah, that's a great. It is. Um. Uh, people are going to want to keep up with you and see what's going on. And Connie said, this is a great way to show how their creations can become art for children. I think, which is really great and yeah. make them want to do something other than, you know, stay locked to their well, Nintendos. What, he actually, we did those drawings. We developed that particular blanket for a little boy. A friend's son was going through brain surgery Oof. for the second time in as many months the week before Christmas. And so I got this idea. I had just gotten the book deal and I was like, we need more boy more, more boy images in here, and and I'll just make them the right size in case I can get them into the book. And I asked my son to draw the pictures, and together he helped me pick the colors, and we did the you know design this afghan, and then I had six other friends make the solid squares in between, and it became this great community 
Afghan yeah, project. Gift then. of love kind of yeah. thing. Wonderful. So, so here, here's where you're going to keep up with Lorinda because she's, she's just everywhere. So you, you're you going to have a hard time not keeping up with Lorinda now because I know everybody's fascinated with this technique. So first of all, you can, of course, go to Linda's uh, website, which is, uh, I can't, recrochations. Am I saying that right? Recrochations. There we go. So, um, so you can follow Linda's blog there and you can see what she's up to. Lorinda, Linda is my mom. Rolinda, Linda, Linda. Did Lorinda. I just call you? Did I just call you Linda? <laughs> that's all good. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Lorinda. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I figured once you started, you might keep going. So. I probably would because it's like it's after lunch, and I forgot to eat breakfast today, and so my I I think I'm a little deprived. My brain is not getting enough oxygen today, so that's where you're gonna find. That's where you're gonna keep up with Lorinda is right here, and then if you go to oh, oh you want me back? Yeah. Can you scroll down a little oh, bit? Oh, isn't there? Oh, here's the mystery machine. Right there. Afghan. Click on the mystery machine. Yes. And if you click on it, it goes to a post that has the links to. Which I, I oh, know, my link, God. The whole story of it. So. Is this just the cutest thing ever? Oh, oh, my God. It's like. <gasps> and honestly, that was the first thing I sent out into the world. That was my original design. And it, it won first place Afghans and the People's Choice Award at that competition. And it's, you know, and, and four days later, I sent in my submission, first submission to a book. <laughs> that was oh my, my life. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, this Somebody is like getting, this is getting crazy. This is getting like crazy love in the room. So that's just, <laughs> un, it's unbelievable. So there you can see the story of the, the mystery machine, which I'm going to go back and read because that's just so funny. <laughs> so, and then if you're looking for Lorinda on Facebook, what you don't want is her personal Facebook page under her name. What you want is this. Her recrochation, crochations, I'm going to get that right, um, a page on uh, Facebook where you can keep up with what kind of crazy stuff she has going on in the crochet world. And then, of course, you know, Twitter. Hello. So uh, same thing, same name under, um, under on Twitter. So, and then for those who are on Ravelry, Lorinda has a designer page, which oddly enough actually has her name on it. There, go, <laughs> go figure, made it easy, for, made it easy for people. So, of which we always appreciate. So some lucky person in the room today is going to win a copy of this book. And I'm really excited because I got an advanced PDF version of this book, so I'm keeping it. So um, I don't have to. I don't have to come up with a decision as whether I keep it or whether it goes. So, um, so if you don't, though, you know the first place to go, of course, is to your own local yarn store because we do want to support the yarn stores as much as possible and and uh, encourage them to continue to stock books that make us all. Um, make us all happy, give us things to dream about. And then if you they don't stock it, the next place you're going to go is you're going to go, of course, to Planet Pearl. And this is, we get the tiniest, tiniest little commissions from, uh, from the, um, from uh, Amazon, but it does help pay for things like go to meeting, which is how we put these events on and for our um, hosting package and all that good stuff. So when you do that, you're going to go to Planet Pearl, you're going to click on books and oh my gosh, the very first book on the list would happen to be reversible <laughs> color crochet that if you click on it, you'll find a link that says buy the book through Amazon and support Planet Pearl, which we know you want to do. So, um, so try your yarn store first and if not, come back and get it through Amazon from us, through us. So, yeah. So, and Trisha says she's going to be checking out this mystery machine evolution. Absolutely. I, I can't wait to read that story because that's the, that is the craziest, that is without a doubt, the craziest <laughs> Afghan I've ever seen knitted or crocheted. So it's just, it's just, it's like, it's awesome. So God bless you, Lorinda is all I can say. Cause I'm, I'm looking forward to actually now upping my, my crochet mojo and doing some color work. Okay. So yeah, I'm inspired now. So, Oh, and Connie says, thanks for the webcast. You're so, you're so welcome. I, there's so much fun and it's a chance, you know, for people who design to actually meet the people who knit their stuff and crochet their stuff, which is also cool for those of us who write and design. So very nice. So Lorinda, thank you so much for coming to join us. You got something else in the works now because I can't imagine you're just sitting around 
like <laughs> eating bonbons. Yeah, I'm getting right now. I'm developing all day classes on the technique that I'll be teaching at Oregon Flock and Fiber in Canby, Oregon, and uh, Stitch Fest is a, a retreat through an Astoria. Astoria Stitch Fest is going to be in October, and um, so those will be my first um, big events that I'm I'm teaching and wonderful trying to branch out. I taught for years at at Michael stores and 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 uh, a couple local yarn stores, and I've been. So now I'm excited to get going with, <laughs> with the, yeah. Well, and it's 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 beautiful and it's inventive, and we always love like crazy new stuff to try. And uh, yeah, and Lisa says to, thanks, and she's looking forward to videos, which I'm sure everybody is. For those of us who aren't living, who don't live in the Oregon area, because I know you're yeah. in Portland, right? Or yeah, yeah. yeah, that area. So that um, that if we're not there, if we're not there in person. Um, we'd love to have, you know, video yes. of you not to put any pressure on. Well, so, um, no, we'll get it, to that point. We'll get, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it all comes right all in its own good time. So yeah, Kate says she's excited about this book and rightfully so. So people in the room, hang on because you know, what's coming next. I'm going to give away a book. So thank you so much, Lorinda. It was thank such you. a pleasure to have you today. I can't wait. I can't wait to have you back because I know this will not be the last book on this technique and, I'm interested to see what you, what crazy thing you come up with next. So thank All you right. so much. <laughs> thank you. Everyone hang around. We're going to give away a book.